Great. We're going to talk about the Quran tonight. Um, we're going to do a number of things, but what we're going to do specifically is we're going to show it, uh, basically expose the Quran internally, and then the second half, the second hour, we're going to go and ask some critical questions from an external standpoint. This is primarily from a historical standpoint. And some of the material I'll be using in the second hour are, uh, are, will be rather controversial. Uh, they are new. Uh, they're material that's been put together here in Britain and, uh, and in Germany. And it's exciting to see what's happening to this book here. Here's my Quran. As you can see, it's, I keep it very small. I do that for a purpose. It's the Quran that I use at Speaker's Corner. It's the Quran that I use uh, when I engage with Muslims. I try to make sure, and you might want to do the same thing, if you're going to use a Quran, try to get one that has both English and Arabic next to it. Uh, because much of what I'm going to say today, many of the verses, uh, the references I'm going to give you, uh, if you were to read them to a Muslim, they will probably tell you they're not there. They will probably say that is not the Quran. And the reason why is because they have not read the Quran. They will not know that it's there. Or if, they, if you do read it in English, they'll say that's not a good translation or that's not what the Quran really says. So let them read the Arabic and pull their bluff. Because you will find that 85% uh, of all Muslims don't read Arabic. Uh, they assume that that's the only way the Quran can be read. But what I would engage you to do when you talk with your Muslim friends, and what we're doing tonight is to help you to learn how to talk with your Muslim friends. When you talk to them about this book, and this will be their authority, this is the book they believe uh, was compiled over a period of 22 years from 610 till 632, that uh, period that Muhammad was first living in Mecca, 610 to 622, and then the last 10 years from 622 to 632, living in Medina. And obviously, as I've said before, when you look at the Quran itself, and you just basically split it in half. If you take a Quran and just split it right down the middle, this goes from right to left because it follows the Arabic. This first half would be Medinan. The second half would be Meccan, the name of the two cities. But obviously, the first part that was revealed to the Prophet is the second half. And then, of course, when, to, when he moved to Medina in 622, this first part then was revealed to the prophet there. And the reason why they do that is because the Quran is put together in what is the largest back down to what is the smallest. So the largest surahs, the largest books are in the Medinan part. The smaller books are in the Meccan period. Now, what you need to do, ask your Muslim friends uh, concerning what their claims are. Just ask them, what is it about the Quran that makes it so good? Find out what their claims are. And you'll find that they'll say probably it is inimitable. Inimitable, that's a big word. Basically, it, it, it is perfect in every uh, case. It is perfect in every area. And what they'll say is a number of things. They'll say it is superior to all other revelations. There, no, there is no other scripture that can equal the Quran. They'll say it is stylistically perfect, that it is grammatically perfect. It has no grammatical errors uh, in, within its pages. It is linguistically perfect in that it uses perfect Arabic. It is an, uh, the language of God that is unique to the world. It is universally unique in that it, it is applicable everywhere at all times in all places. It has no contradictions. It has no errors. Compiled perfectly. And it has no history. Now these are the major claims you're going to hear. There may be some others that you might get as well. But this is pretty much the material that you're going to get, you're going to hear when you're talking with them. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go down each one of those claims. We're going to go down and show you how you can answer them, how you can critique them, how you can do this yourself, not just me doing it. You can be, should be able to do this after tonight. So let's start out with the first claim. And the first one is that it is unique. According to the Hadith, the Hadith would be the sayings of the Prophet, Mishkat 3, page 664. It mentions that the Quran is the greatest wonder among the wonders of the world. This book is second to none in the world according to the unanimous decision of the learned men in points of diction, style, rhetoric, thoughts, and soundness of laws and regulation to shape the destinies of mankind. So you can see the claims right there. It is second to none. This is the greatest of all books. Many times when I do debates with Muslims on the Bible versus the Quran, I just did a debate last month in South Africa, Johannesburg, looking at the Bible and the Quran, a three hour long debate, and this claim came up as well. I remember doing a debate here at Trafalgar Square with Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, an impromptu debate, and at the very end of the debate, after he could not come up with any more response, he then turned to Surah 10, Ayah 37, uh, and verse 38, Surah 2, Ayah 23, and Surah 17, Ayah 88, which stipulates that there is no other, and basically asks, 
Will they say Muhammad hath forged it? Answer, bring therefore a chapter like unto it, or a surah like unto it, and call whom ye to your assistance, besides Allah, if ye should speak. So this is the surah like it argument. Show me anything that can equal this book, Mr. Smith, is what they asked me. And I remember uh, at that time, when I was asked to do that in Trafalgar Square, I just took my Bible out, opened up to Psalm 23, and there with the microphone, I just started reading Psalm 23, slowly. And... Uh, pronouncing every word and after about halfway through they turned the sound off well I've got a loud voice from speaker's corner so I just used my speaker's corner voice and continued reading Psalm 23 after I had finished Psalm 23 I closed my Bible turned to the sheikh and show me I said show me a surah like that show me anything in the Quran that equals Psalm 23 you don't even have to use Psalm 23 you could go to whatever is your favorite chapter if you are given this argument and you will for heaven's sakes go back to the Bible it is better than anything you'll find in the Quran and don't just stop there, as I've said in the past. When you give the, get this claim and when you get this challenge, answer it by saying, the Bible has it, let me show you, here is one example. Don't just stop there by saying it, then tell them why it's better. Tell them what Psalm 23 talks about. Look at the shepherd, look what God is. Do you have a shepherd like this? Does your God come and walk and talk with you? Does your God walk you through the valley of the shadow of death? Does your God, can your God even relate to you like this God can? Once you start preaching, man, you've then got the gospel and you're preaching it because you, the challenge has come from them to begin with. Surah like it, we've got hundreds of surah like it. Psalm 2, Psalm 1, Matthew 5, 1 Corinthians 13, whatever is your favorite chapter, go there, use it, and then preach from it. They would like to say it's better. There comes nothing close to what we have in the Bible. Now, Muslims claim that it is, has perfect literary style and content. Yet, when you compare... We've put a list up there of different categories that you could put a whole other list, many, many lists like this, with the Bible alongside it. If you want to just use these in your handout, you've got them in front of you. Surah 16 uh, talks about that Allah is in control, whereas when you look at 1 Timothy and Luke 15, God lets us choose. You can see even the content is better in the Bible. The wrath of Allah is found in Surah 11. The love of God is found in Francis of Sisi's prayer, if you want to use that. The, the, uh, the reference, there's many references, we just put a few up there, that you are to fight your enemies in Matthew 5, 1 Corinthians 30. We are to bless and love our enemies. You can see what a contrast there are between these two references. Allah leaves us alone in Surah 109, and Allah, Jesus, I'm sorry, not Allah, please may I forgive me on that one. God, the Lord, is our shepherd. In Surah 24, 2, we are to flog sinners in John 8, 3 to 12. We are to forgive sinners. So you can see what a contrast we have just verse by verse, uh, reference by reference. And then for you women, if you ever want to go and talk to Muslims, look at Surah 2 and look at Surah 4. We'll talk about it a little bit later tonight, how you can just use those two surahs and the verses that are there just to show you what the Quran says versus what the Bible says in references like Ephesians 5, where a man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and as Christ was willing to die for the church, so a man must be willing to die for his wife. What a contrast to Surah 4, Ayah 34, that allows a man to beat his wife if she disobeys him. Now, these are the kind of content scripture references that you need to use when they make the claim that there's no other book like the Quran when it comes to efficacy, when it comes to uh, style, and all the rest. What they also say is that it has no literary defect. Yet, those of you who have had a chance to read the Quran, have you noticed there are no complete stories? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when you read the Quran, it doesn't go, there's no theme that it follows? It jumps all over the place. It may start with John the Baptist, it may jump to Moses, then go back to Abraham, and then it may have something that come to another reference that you know nothing about, or it doesn't really begin or end. It assumes you already know the background to the story. And the Quran is full of that. It jumps all over the place. There's no chronology, there's no transitional phrases to help you to go from story to story. It's confusing, it's full of repetition, jumps all over the, from one topic to another, inconsistencies in its grammar, law, and theology. Verbs have been left out. Adjectives have been left out in other places. And that's why it's so confusing for Muslims to read. In fact, 20% of the Quran is not even understood by the scholars. A fifth of this book, even the scholars don't understand. And that's the dilemma for many Muslims who say it's such a great book for today, that it's a great litmus, it's a great standard for all of mankind. How can it be if you can't even understand it? A good portion of it. So they'll go on and make other claims. They'll say that nobody, nobody has found it to be difficult to read. Yet let's see what the experts have to say. Now these are men who've spent their whole lives, their whole careers 
studying the Quran. Men like Salman Rayrak out of Germany who says this, from the literary point of view, the Quran has little merit. Declamation, repetition, puerility, lack of logic and coherence strike the unprepared reader at every turn. It is humiliating to the human intellect to think that this mediocre literature has been the subject of innumerable commentaries and that millions of men are still wasting time in absorbing it. Now, let him say that, don't you say that. All right, he's the expert. He has spent his whole career studying it, you have not. But you can certainly quote it and you can show that these are, this is the conclusion of those who have spent time studying it. If theirs is their conclusion, why should we doubt it? Theodor Noldecke, who comes out of Germany also, mentions this about the Quran, saying that it is full of chaotic confusion, prosaic, stiff in style, tedious sermonizing, rhetorical, never metrical, and the rhyme on the whole a burdensome yoke. Superfluous verbiage, syntax betrays great awkwardness, tiresome effect of its endless iterations, so that dogma turns a defective, now listen to this, this is what he says, a defective literary production into, the, uh, into an unrivaled masterpiece, comma, only in the eyes of the believers. And that's true. And that's why you will find many people who have studied the Quran come to these kind of conclusions. The vast majority of Muslims that say it's such a great book have never read it. They cannot read it because they're not permitted to read it in their own language. And those that have read it in their own language tend not to make these claims. Now, they will claim that it is grammatically perfect. And for those of you who are Arab speakers, there's lots of uh, grammatical mistakes. Uh, we've got a few, just, I've just got uh, about four that I've put up on, the, up on the screen. It's not for you people to get into this. Let the Arab speakers get into this. Let them deal with it because they are the ones that understand it. Don't try to uh, run this one through, otherwise you'll be, uh, they'll hang you. And it's no reason for you to, because you won't understand what you're talking about anyways. But certainly you do need to know that it has f lots of grammatical errors uh, that we're finding. They say that it uses perfect Arabic. This is God's language, yet we have found almost, uh, we have found words in almost 15 different languages, including Egyptian, Hebrew, Syriac, Christian Aramaic, and Ethiopic words. E Akkadian words such as Adam and Eden found 24 times in the Quran. Yet, ironically, there is an Arabic word that would have been, could have been used, basharan, or insan could have been used. Jannah, instead of Eden, in place of Eden. Why didn't they use these Arabic words for those titles? Assyrian words such as Abraham, sometimes recorded as Ibrahim, the correct Arabic equivalent would have been Abu Rahim. Persian words such as Sidat, that's that razor sharp bridge that people must walk across to get into heaven. That Sidat razor sharp bridge is a Persian word, yet there is an Arab alternative. Why didn't they use Al-Tariq? Hur, meaning the disciples. Uh, has the Arab equivalent of Tilmith or Firdaus, the highest of the seven heavens where, Maha, where God is and where Muhammad went to when he was there in that, uh, when he went in fact on back of the, uh, the seven heavens on back of the, uh, the winged horse. Now, there is a word in Arabic for that, Jannah, or Greek words such as Injil, which is a, the gospel, it's a deformation of the word Injil in Evangelion, which has come from uh, Greek. They could have used Bishara. So there's lots of Arabic words that could have been used. The fact that they did not use these words seemed to suggest that these words were borrowed from other sources, does it not? And that's exactly what we're saying. The reason these words are incorporated into the Quran is what you're gonna find in the second hour, much of the Quran has been borrowed. And it's because it's been borrowed that these words are there, which obviates the whole idea that this is, could come from God or that it could be something that has always existed in heaven. The fact that it uses so many, termina, so many names, dates, and places and events that are human-induced proves that this is nothing more than a human document. We'll get into that much more uh, accurately when we talk about it in the second hour. They say that it's the universal paradigm for all of mankind. So this book is the, basically the litmus. This is the standard for all of mankind everywhere in every age. Now there's many ways you can tackle this one. And one of the things I like to do is to do it on two fronts. The first one I do is usually looking at women's position. When you look at what the Quran says about women, and I said this before and I'll say it again, you need to go to Surah 2 and Surah 4. In Surah 4, Ayah 3, where it says that a man can have up to four wives. In Surah 4, Ayah 34, that says a man can beat his wife. In Surah 4, Ayah 11, that says a man has twice the inheritance of a woman. 
And then in Surah 2, Ayah 282, that a man has twice the testimony in court of a woman. And then the most horrendous one in Surah 2, Ayah 223, which stipulates that a woman is nothing more than a tilth for a man. And a man may go and plow her whenever he wants to. Horrendous verses when you, when you look at it there. According to Surah 33, Ayah 50, it says that also a man may have as many concubines as he wants, as many as his right hand owneth. Now, if you look at the biblical references, if you just look at the contrast that we have in the Bible, in every case we can see that women come out on top, and that's the beauty of the New Testament, and that's the beauty of the gospel message. We are told that a man must only have one wife in Genesis 2, Matthew 19, 1 Timothy 3. That a man is to love his wife, according to 1 Peter 3, never treat them harshly, Colossians 3. That the testimony of a woman is equal to that of a man. In fact, the first people who were, give, who were uh, uh, shown a resurrected Christ were women for that reason. And the equality that we see in Galatians 3, 28, and Hebrews 4, 1 Peter 3, and 1 Corinthians 7, and I could have added to that Ephesians 5 that I mentioned earlier, stands in stark contrast to what we're seeing in the Quran. So certainly you have to ask, which is the more universal book? These verses that you find in the Quran, allowing men to beat their wives, half the testimony, half the inheritance, or the equality that we find in the New Testament. To me, it's an older book, and yet it is still as universally applied today as the day it was written down. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ. The other area you can look at is to look at the violence that we see in the Quran. Now, I'm sorry, before we do that, let's just go on and continue with paradise. Uh, I should have mentioned this because this also came up in the speech we talked we had on the hermeneutical key where we looked at paradise and we could see that, that the paradise that was there is not a paradise for women. It's basically a paradise for men, isn't it? A very carnal paradise. Wine, wine, women, and song, which you can get in Las Vegas. Why wait now? But more than that, it's certainly a paradise that's missing the most important ingredients. And of course, what's missing and what we find in the Bible is that God is in paradise. It's God who is walking and talking. The cool of the day, he was there at the very beginning. He'll be there at the very end. And that's the beauty of even bringing and engaging in this, this kind of uh, talk. When you look at the paradise that's there, as they say, as you find in Surah 55 and Surah 56, it's a place where women wait upon men, these perpetual virgins called hoodies. Where they come from, I don't know. And I'm not going to ask my Muslim friend anymore. I've been punched in the face for asking that question. But the, probably the more damaging part of the Quran, the one that Muslims don't want you to talk about, is the, the problem of violence. If you look at the two halves of the Quran, when you look at the Quran, as I said earlier, the Meccan surahs, which are in the back, the Medidians, which are in the front, these precede these. When you look at the Meccan surahs, you will find there's a lot of verses that are basically peaceful. They don't say too much about peace, but there's not too much here that we would have a problem with. It's when you get to the Medinan surahs, the beginning part of the Quran, that you find the enormous amount of violence. And of course, a lot of Muslims today are saying, this is not so. You won't find these violence there. Uh, the, Islam is a religion of peace. You've probably seen it on the buses going around town. Islam is peace. Have you seen that? They're, they're either trying to persuade you or maybe they're trying to persuade themselves because they don't quote any scriptures below that. Have you noticed that? And when you see them on television and when you see them uh, on the radio, when they say that we are a people of peace, I'm sure they are. But when they say Islam is a religion of peace, I would like to know how they can support that. When they especially say that this book is a book of peace, I would like to know what references they're going to. Because if I'm going to make that claim about the Bible, I would have to have something to support it as well. I would have to be able to uh, source it. And yet you do not find that with the Quran. Well, you do. And what they do usually go to are verses like this. In the Quran, you will find some verses such as Surah 2, Ayah 256, which says there is no compulsion in religion. Now that sounds pretty peaceful, doesn't it? You do not force yourself, your religion on another. What they're not telling you is that that's a very early verse. Now, why is that important? Well, in Surah 2, Ayah 106, and Surah 16, Ayah 101, it has a, what we call a law of abrogation. When you look at these, the Quran and you look at the two halves, you will find that there's lots of contradictory verses. There's about 200 contradictory verses between these two halves, between the Medina and the Meccan Surahs. What are you going to do with all these contradictions? Well, they've applied these two verses to obviate that. So this is the law of abrogation, which stipulates if you have two contradictory verses, you go with the later verse. You throw out the first one, it's, it's abrogated by the later verse. Surah 2, Ayah 256, is a much earlier verse. It was revealed to the prophet, according to tradition, when he first moved up to Medina, between 622 and 624. That first two years that he was in Medina, he was trying to create a, a good relationship with the Jews that were there. And it worked for two years. While those two years were there, this verse was then revealed, which says that there is no compulsion in religion, which would make sense if you're trying to get alongside the Jews. 
When that did not work and the, the uh, relationship then broke down in 624, the other verses started to come in huge numbers, and you'll see exactly how many a little later. So what you need to ask is, if this is a peace verse, is it abrogated by any verses that come after? And it's abrogated by 101 verses that come after. There's 101 verses that stand against this verse. They are nasik, uh, uh, which means stronger. The others are mansuk, which means weak. This is a mansuk verse. It's a weak verse. It's therefore not authoritative. So then they usually jumped to Surah 2, Ayah 190 to 193, which says, those who fight you do not transgress limits. Now remember, we've just got this document that came through two or three weeks ago from these 138 scholars there in Jordan saying that Christianity and Islam must agree on the love of God and the love of our neighbors. Those are the two themes that this letter is talking about. And they're asking us to not only under, to uh, come on board with them on the love of God, and of course they're defining the love of God as having no partners, which is an attack against our Trinitarian formula in Surah 3, Ayah 76. But they're also saying there, we must also come alongside Muslims for, with the context of the love of God. The love of God is what is referred to here. Those who fight you, however... Those who fight you, so if you do love them, if they fight you, you must respond, you, but you must not transgress limits, which seems pretty peaceful, until you read the rest of the verse, which then says, and slay them wherever you catch them, and fight them until they prevail faith in Allah. Now, you cannot just read one half the verse and not read the verses that come after. So what limits are they transgressed once I'm dead? Can you see the problem? And that's the difficulty with exegesis. Do not let Muslims get away with that. They do that all the time with our scriptures as well, as we're going to find in about three weeks when we look at Muhammad in Deuteronomy 18. They only read half the verse of verse 15. They don't read the other half to define who a brother is. And the brother is very uh, delineated there. It's, and then they don't go on to the next verses to tell us who is it we're to do, what was it we're to do with a prophet who claims to be from God but does not know God's name were to put him to death. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? So it's obvious you need to be careful of these verses. So usually by the time you've passed Surah 2, 190, they then go to Surah 5, 31 to 32. Now, Surah 5, 31 is, is a story about Cain, who has killed his brother Abel, doesn't know what to do with the body. And so he sees a, a, a raven scratching in the ground, and he follows the example of the raven and buries his brother. It's the next verse that's interesting. Verse 32 says, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Which seemed to suggest, don't go slaying, go about saving. It's a good verse, isn't it? It almost sounds like a redemption analysis. What's that doing in the Quran? I won't tell you that right now, because that's exciting when we find out where it came from. But of course, what I wanted to ask is, well, how do you exegete this verse? So I asked my nominal liberal friend over here, and they say, well, that means we must not be hurting anybody, we must not slay, we must not be saving, we must be go about saving. So then I asked my radical friend on this side, and he says, wait a minute, what, who are the people referring to? Instead of people, change it to Muslim. So then you read it, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a Muslim, and then they'll stop me and say a Muslim in Chechnya or Bosnia or Kosovo or Iraq or Afghanistan or any other place of the Muslim world, if you slay a Muslim there, it would be as if you slayed all Muslims, including me here in living in London. And if anyone saved the life of a Muslim in any one of those countries, which means I must go and save their life in Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, Chechnya, and all these other countries, if I go and save just one Muslim there, I have saved all of Islam. I have saved all of Muslims. Now, who's correct? Who's got the better exegesis? Who's basically interpreted this verse correctly? Well, you could either say both are correct or they're both wrong, because look at the very beginning of that verse. We ordain for the children of Israel. Have they missed that point? Does this have anything to do with Muslims? This is for the children of Israel. These are for Jews. But once you throw that out, then you can basically, you can interpret the verse any way you want. And that's what's happening today with this debate that's going on within Islam. Internally, there's a real debate happening as to how you take these verses and how you interpret them. In a few weeks, we're going to go and unpack this much more in depth and look and see the difficulty of uh, peace versus violence in Islam. But what I do know is my radical friends immediately take me to Surah 9.5. They say, listen, this is the most authoritative surah because this is the last surah that was revealed to the prophet in 632. That's the year the prophet died. If it's the last surah, it's the most authoritative surah. It, it, it abrogates, remember that law of abrogation we just talked about? It abrogates all these other verses and read what it says. But when the forbidden months are passed, then fight and slay those who join other gods with Allah wherever ye find them. Besiege them, seize them, lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. Is that relevant for today? Are we permitted to do that today? 
is this a universal document? Can you see the problem? When my radical friend starts you showing these verses to me, suddenly I, I sit up and I pay attention. Surah 929, I, met, I did a debate at Cambridge University where that verse was exegeted and the, uh, Azam Tamimi, who was sitting next to me, says, that had nothing to do with you, Mr. Smith. That has only to do with the Mushriks. And I said, who are the Mushriks? And he said, the Hindus. Well, half the audience was made up of Hindus and he lost the debate because you don't say that at Cambridge University. And then he says, then I said, so therefore it has nothing to do with you. I said, what about verse 29, which says, make war upon such of those to whom the scriptures have been given. That does have to do with me. I am one of the people of the book. So are all of you. We're all people of the book. Ali Kitab. They're to make war upon us. There it is in Surah 929. Or then they go and look at the methodology of these sword verses in Surah 47.4. Strike off their heads, it says there. In Surah 838, of the unbelievers, fight them until they have faith in Allah, until you impose Islam on them. The recompense for those who do this, in Surah 474, to him who fighteth in the cause of Allah, soon shall we give him a rewarding of great value. Or in Surah 47, verse 4 to 6, but those who are killed, they will be admitted to paradise. Can you then understand, if this is in the Quran, can you then understand why so many people are volunteering to, do, to fight in the cause of Allah? To be killed because they know that is the only. Remember last week I said there is no assurance of salvation. I lied. There is an assurance and here it is right here in the Quran. There is only one assurance of salvation in Islam. And that is if you fight in the cause of Allah and you die, you're going to be right, go straight to heaven. There it is. You cannot argue with scripture. And that's why these verses are so dangerous. Take a look at those verses. Those are all sword verses in the Medinan surahs. 149 of them. Now, why is it Muslims tell us that this book here is a book of peace? And why is it they tell us that this is the most universal document today? If this is universal, I want Muslims to start condemning, condemning those verses. You will not hear Muslims condemn those verses. The vast majority of Muslims you come across don't even know those verses exist. We've been able to find 149 of them there on the screen. We'll talk more about that later. Now, they say that the Quran was compiled perfectly and uniquely and has always existed in heaven. I was, remember when I was first getting into Islam about 25 years ago, I came across these references that I found were rather interesting. Because when you look at the Quran and you look at the stories that are there, a lot of the stories in the Quran deal with people we know about. Abraham, up on the screen. We know about Abraham. We know quite a bit about him. But when I go to Surah 21, Ayah 70, 51 to 71, the story that I read there is not found in my Bible. And I'd like to know where it came from. In that story, there are idols in the Kaaba, are there idols there in Mecca, and Muhammad, or Abraham is there, although it doesn't say exactly what city he's in, but he doesn't like all these idols, so in the middle of the night, he gets up and he destroys the idols using a larger idol. The next day, the people come to him and they accuse him of doing this. He says, don't ask me, ask the idol. Well, they can't talk to idols, so they take Abraham, uh, Abraham and they throw him into a fiery pit. Is that story in your Bible? No, but it's, there is a similar story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Can you see there may be a confusion here? But I would like to know where this story comes from. Muslims tell me it comes from heaven. Yet I found the exact same story in the Midrash Rabbah, a Jewish folktale. So also you can find it in the Jonathan ben Uziel, and second century apocryphal writing. This is a Jewish apocryphal writing that was then incorporated in Surah 21, Ayah 51 to 71. The same thing you'll find with Mount Sinai in Surah 7, Ayah 171. You'll find that in Abad Asara, a second century document. The story of Cain and Abel that I just told you about earlier. Cain kills his brother, doesn't know what to do with it, so he takes, finds a, a raven scratching in the ground. He follows the example and buries his brother. That story is found almost word for word in the Targum of John from Ben Uzziah in the second century AD. The second part of it that we talked about earlier, verse 32, that redemption analysis about the blood of one, if you slay one is if you slay all, if you save one is just if you save all. That uh, analysis is actually found not in the Jonathan ben Uzziah. It is found in another document that incorporates the story of Cain and Abel. But in the fifth century, while a scribe was writing it out, while he was writing it out in the text, in the margin of the text, he wrote out this, this redemptive analysis about the blood of Abel just doing it off the top of his head. And he wrote it in the margin. If you slay one, take the blood of one, you take the blood of all. But if you save the blood of one, you save the blood of all. It was nothing more than a musing of a scribe just thinking out loud. The next century, when the story of ben Uzziah was then put in the, in the uh, Mishnah Sanhedrin, in the late 5th century, early 6th century, that story of Cain and Abel and that editorial comment by that scribe is incorporated into the text. So you have the story of Cain and Abel followed by this redemptive analysis on the blood of Abel, both of them together in a text by the 6th century, which are then incorporated and put into the Quran completely in Surah 5, Ayah 31 and 32. 
What does that tell you? Did this come from heaven? No, we know who wrote it. We know when it was written. We know why it was written. It was written by a man, a scribe. Fascinating. The more we scratch, the more we find. Oh, I won't get into that. You know what's going to happen in about two weeks when I start repeating that with the Bible. But certainly, they do not shine. No wonder they whine. Because this is the problem. We're doing this kind of material. We call it source criticism. And we're starting to find lots of documents that support where the Quran has been borrowed from. Probably my favorite story is this one here, the story of Solomon and Sheba. Some of you have heard me say it before. Uh, this is the story where Solomon, he um, takes his birds and he gets them ready for battle. He's the first one to have created an air force of birds that would fly up over the enemy and drop stones on the enemy with the name of the enemy on the bottom of the stones. As he was marching his birds, getting them ready for battle, the hoopah bird was missing. And he gets angry. Where's my hoopah bird? And then he sees way in the south the hoopah bird coming and flying towards him, lands at his feet, and tells him about this beautiful queen in the country of Sheba. He talks to birds. And he says, well, I don't have the time. I have to march my birds. You head on back down there and find that queen and bring her up to me. So the bird flaps on back down to Sheba, lands at the, at the feet of the queen, and says to the queen, she talks to birds, that there's this great king in the north, and you've got to come and see him. So she decides to come with her whole retinue. They come up to Jerusalem. They go into the throne room there, and Solomon is sitting on the throne. She comes in the door, and there between Solomon and her is this mirrored floor, a big, big mirrored floor. Now, she's never seen that before. They don't have that kind of technology in Sheba. She thinks it's water. So she picks up her skirts to keep them from getting wet. And that's where it ends, in Surah 27, verse 44. Have you heard that story before? Well, you heard me say it earlier. But outside of me, you've never heard that story, and it's certainly not in our Bible, but it's an entertaining story, isn't it? Birds flying up in the battle, a hoop of birds missing, talking to the man, talking to the woman, coming up, a, a, a nice mirrored floor, picking up her skirts. So where did this story come from? Well, we found, we found the source of the story. It's in the second Targum of Esther, a second century document which says almost the exact same story, word for word, except for the very end. At the very end, when she picks up her skirt, she has hairy legs. And when Solomon sees the hairy legs, he cries out in surprise. <laughs> for obvious reasons, they kept that part out of the Quranic account. But can you see what's happened? They've taken a story willingly right out of the second century and incorporated it into the Quran, and they say this comes from God. None of it comes from God. What we now know, this is a folk tale for basically was created by the Jews, was actually borrowed from other surrounding nations, but was incorporated into the Talmud as an entertainment for children. And yet it finds its way, supposedly, into the greatest of all revelations according to Islam, this book right here. See, that's why we need to do this kind of work. We need to find out where these stories come from. They don't come from God. They come from man. And in some cases, made for children. Bless their hearts. But therefore, we need to show it and expose it when we see it. Now, others concerning Jesus have also been sourced elsewhere. We find that he uh, eats under a palm tree, bends it down so he and his mother can eat in Surah 19. That story, almost word for word, comes in the last book of the Bible, a second century sectarian account. We also find the story of his childhood where he talks as a baby to the wise men when they come to his cradle in Surah 19. Uh, when he creates birds out of clay, he blows on them and they fly up into the air. Those stories are not unique. They have been borrowed. One, the first one of him talking comes from the first gospel infancy of Jesus Christ. The second one of him creating birds out of clay comes from the gospel infancy of Jesus Christ. Both of them are second century documents. Now, when you look at the Quran, you will also find a lot of poetry. In fact, many Muslims say this is the miracle of Muhammad. When you read the Quran, an awful lot of it is poetic. There's a lot of poetic verse. And they would say, because it's so poetic, because it's so beautiful, no man could have written this. And so they say, it's this poetry then that has been ascribed to Muhammad, who is illiterate, could not read or write. And because he could not read or write, how could he come up with such gorgeous poetry? Well, there have been some scholars who've been looking at that poetry. Two in, in particular, um, one in Germany named Gunther Lulling, who's a good friend of mine, and another also in Germany named Dr. Luxembourg. Both of them have looked at these, these poetic verses, and they've noticed that they've seen these verses before, but not in Arabic. Both of them are Syriac scholars, and so they went back to their Syriac writings, independent of each other. They didn't know each other was doing the research, and they were able to come up with most of these stories, these poetry, sorry, these poetic verses, almost word for word the same, but they aren't in Arabic. These are pre-Islamic Christian hymns written in the Syriac in the 6th century. They were written by Christians, 
written in Syriac, taken out of the Syriac, and then interposed and imposed really into Arabic. And that's why you have many of these grammatical mistakes. Because you can't just take one language and impose it without carrying with it also the grammatical structure of that language. Now, isn't this fascinating? The beautiful poetry that has been attributed to Muhammad actually comes from Christians. So if you want to say it's divinely inspired, then give credit to the Christians who wrote it. Thank God that we know how to write. But none of those Christians would say it's divinely inspired. It just shows you that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can write quite amazing things. But don't give credit to Muhammad for this. Thank God the Christians in the 5th and 6th century knew what they were saying. But this is why we need to look at it, show it, expose it, and prove that this is nothing more than a book written by man. Not God, not eternal, and certainly not universal. Now what about the contradictions? Well, I could go on all night about the contradictions. If you want to look at the papers that we're going to give you at the end of the course, uh, there are, I've got a, there's about 200 that we've been able to find. There's about 50 that we use uh, at Speaker's Corner on university campuses. Let me just make this warning. Be careful about the contradictions. The reason why is because Muslims love to also attack the Bible with the supposed contradictions in the Bible. You'll see them doing this all the time. Uh, remember back in the 1990s, I was doing a debate with Shabir Ali, and he had put, he incorporated a, a book, a pamphlet that was making its rounds around the university called 101 Contradictions, Clear Contradictions of the Bible. And this became, made its rounds around the university, and he handed me a copy at the debate. He says, what are you going to do with these contradictions in the Bible? Well, I scratched my head, and I said, I can't sit there and tell you and answer all 101 contradictions. Uh, let me work on it. So I went back, and with f uh, three other friends, we basically went and found answers to every one of these contradictions. And that's up. we're going to give you this paper uh, at the end of this course so you can have them on hand. And when the next debate I had was Shabir Ali. I think it was in Manchester, or maybe it was in Leicester University. When we, at the beginning of that debate, I handed him 101 cleared up contradictions of the Bible in response. Because what happens is that Muslims make many mistakes about our Bible. And we'll talk more about that in two weeks when we unpack the Bible and look at the challenges that they throw at our Bible and how to just defend it. And it's lovely to be able to defend the Bible because we don't have any of these problems like they have here with the Quran in our scriptures. That's the beauty of this whole debate. And that's why I love debating this material. When you look at these contradictions, though, once you start on the contradiction, it becomes tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat. Well, you've got these, well, we got these, well, you got these, we got these. And it becomes, you spend the whole day just going from contradiction after contradiction, and you really aren't preaching the gospel. I would rather you preach the gospel. So then, in whenever they come up with contradictions in the Bible, just give them my paper, our paper, all right? Hand it to them, say, here you are. They're all answered for there, for you. And if they aren't there, then let us know. If there are new ones that we need to uh, get, uh, move into, let us know, and we'll certainly find them for you. Because they basically make 15 mistakes about our Bible. We don't have these problems with their contradictions. Now, there's uh, quite a few. You can see up on the screen here. There's nothing really that I need to go through. I would rather go into the errors, because these are much more, um, much more da damaging. The errors in the Bible, and they tend to fall into two areas. You have your historical anachronisms. These are historical problems, historical mistakes, and the scientific problems that you find in the, in the Quran. Now, what's fascinating to me is if you were to go and turn on Al Jazeera television on any given night, if you spoke Arabic, now they have an English channel, Al Jazeera, you will find that much every night, Yusuf Al Qaradawi, there in Qatar, in the country of Qatar, gives sermons on the scientific proofs of the Quran. He opens this book and he finds all kinds of scientific proofs. You can find book after book, pamphlet after pamphlet on the scientific proofs of this, of this book. One of the most popular ones is what they call the, um, the uh, what, embryological cycle. The cycle of the four stages of the embryology, embryo that you find in the Quran. It's found in, in four different references. I don't have it on screen. I should have it up in front of you. Let me just tell you what, what we know about it. These four stages of the embryo, and according to the Quran, there is the, the zygote stage, which is the earliest part of the stage. It cannot be seen with the human eye. That's why it's amazing that someone would know about this in the seventh century, because until microscopes were invented in the 1930s, no one could have known about the zygote stage. And then the alaka stage. They call it the chewed meated stage, whatever alaka means. It could be chewed meat, it could be clotted blood. There's lots of different translations for that word. Followed by the bone stage and then ending with the meat stage. Now, these are the four stages that, uh, that Muslims say have been proven by embryologists today. And there's been some very well-noted embryologists that have now supported that, yes, right, these are the four stages that we only know about in the 20th century. How could somebody in the 7th century have known this? Can you see where they're getting at? The thing is, there are many people who have written about stages of the embryology, of embryo. We know that Hippocrates talked about 15 stages. Aristotle talked about 12 to 15 stages. And they were writing in the 4th and 5th century BC. 
But the man you need to go to is Galen. Galen was a Jewish embryologist writing in Greek in the late first, early second century. And in that period of time, he, his material was then being disseminated right across the Greek speaking world. And he talked about four stages. In fact, ironically, the same four stages we find in the Quran. The zygote stage, followed by the, the meated state, the, the chewed blood stage or the chewed meat stage, followed by the bone stage, then followed by the meat stage. The same four stages you find in the Quran, you can find in Galen. Galen was writing in the second century. Nothing's new. They just borrowed from Galen. But Galen made a mistake. Anybody who's done medicine here, I don't know if there's any embryologist sitting in our audience tonight, you do know that when you have a child, an embryo, the meat does not follow the bones. The two grow simultaneously. There is no stage between the bone and the meat. You could not have bones without any meat on them. You just have a skeleton. Can you see the problem? Now, Galen made a very harmless error, but that error is incorporated into the Quran. Bingo, we got him. And it's this kind of stuff that we're looking at that's exciting because what we're showing is that much of this has been borrowed from other sources. Not only are the errors incorporated with them, but we can now then be able to date where these errors came about. Some of these that you have here, they say in Surah 7, Ayah 124, in Surah 12, Ayah 41, according to Moses' story that's in Surah 7, and also the story of Joseph in Surah 12, that when Moses was um, tr doing his, what they call signs, or the, 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 uh, the, di the different stages, the, the 10 different miracles that he did that, uh, plagues as we call them in English, about the fifth or fourth sign, the sorcerers, the Egyptian sorcerers, tried to keep up with Moses, could not keep up with him, so the Pharaoh took those sorcerers and put them on a cross, crucified them. Moses was living in 1400 BC. Joseph was in prison. We know that he was in prison. That story in Surah 12 mentions that while he was there, the baker then was taken out of prison and put on a cross. Joseph was living in 1800 BC. So in 1800 BC and in 1400 BC, you'll have to have crucifixion. Yet we know that crucifixion was invented by Darius, who was living in the 6th century BC. There were no crucifixions before the 6th century BC. So how can you have crucifixions in 1400 BC and in 1800 BC? Can you see the problem? Here's a historical anachronism that's just crying to be heard. Now, Muslims will try to get out of that, and they'll say, well, no, no, there is this little cross that everybody wears around their neck called the Ankh, and possibly some of you are wearing them. Uh, it's very popular in Egypt today, and this can go back to the second millennia. That's the crucifixion we're talking about. Those are the crosses of cruci that people were crucified on. The problem is they don't know what the Ankh is. The Ankh has nothing to do with death. It's a fertility symbol. It's just the opposite of death, and it's always only about that large. You can't really crucify somebody on something that large. I mean, I've never tried it, and I'm not going to try it. But can you see the difficulty? They've tried to borrow something that looks like it because it has the same similar image. It has a, has a little circle at the top to make it look like a cross. That's desperation. But it's these historical anachronism that we're looking at. Um, they, probably one of the most famous ones that you've probably heard that come down the pike is in Surah 19.28, Surah 66, Ayah 12, and Surah 20, Ayah 25 to 30, where you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, that's repeated 25 times, that same Mary is also the sister of Aaron, the daughter of Imran. Now, we have to scratch your head on this one and say, hold on a minute. We've heard that before, haven't we? We know that there is an Aaron in the Old Testament. And he does have a father named Amran, who is Imran. But they, the father, Imran, has a son named Aaron, has another son named Moses. The brother of Moses is Aaron, and they do have a sister named Miriam. You've got the two Marys mixed up. They've got the Mary of the Old Testament with Moses mixed up with Mary, the mother of Jesus. But there's 1,400 years between them. It's a pretty long living Mary. And can you see the problem? You don't, this kind of material and these kind of mistakes do not happen in a book written by God. God will not make a mistake like that unless you just went to sleep over 1,400 years. Thank God we don't have these kind of errors. And it's fascinating how Muslims try to get around them. Now, there's many other, and I see my time just about up. Let me just go and look at the mountains and the dirham and just end with those two. In, according to the Quran, in Surah 16, Surah 21, Surah 31, Ayah 10 is best. It mentions that mountains were put on the earth to keep the earth from shaking. We used to use this one. Muslims used to bring this up to us all the time at Speaker's Corner. And we said, well, okay, if you believe that's so, but have you ever lived in mountains? I grew up in mountains. I grew up in the Himalaya Mountains in India, and I was uh, born there, and I spent 17 years there, and the mountains were shaking all the time. Why? Because mountain ranges are basically nothing more than tectonic plates that are colliding. And as the tectonic plates collide, they make a wrinkle in the Earth's surface. That wrinkle is what the, creates the mountains, so that they're moving up all the time, and they're shaking. My goodness, are they shaking. Uh, if you have any doubt, just go and look in the Himalayas. They're still raising. They're still growing. 
and they grow about this all about the speed of my fingernail every year that's not very fast but obviously as they grow they shift and as they shift you have huge uh, enormous earthquakes which cause all kinds of landslides now Anybody who has studied tectonic plates would have known that, but see, they would not have known of tectonic plates in the seventh century. So you can see why a man looking at these large objects on the Earth's surface would believe they're heavy, therefore they would be made to keep the Earth from shaking. Very simple, simplistic, but not true. We're now knowing that. In Surah 12, Ayah 20, it mentions that Joseph was sold to the Egyptians for a few dirham counted out. Dirham means coins. You count out coins. So we have to scratch our head on that and say, okay, was Joseph ever sold for coins? That's the first question. Well, let's go to Genesis uh, chapter uh, 37, verse 28. In Genesis 37, 28, you have the same story. Joseph is sold to the Midianites for 20 shekels. Has the Bible got it correct? Let's see which is better. Well, we look at the Quran, we ask for the dirham counted out, and you ask when were coins invented? The coins weren't invented until around the seventh century BC. So there were no coins, certainly at the time of Joseph in 1800 BC. We do know, however, that there were shekels in 1800 BC because shekels were invented by the Babylonians in the third millennia. Therefore, they were used by all the peoples of that time. We know from the Mari and the Nuzi tablets that a price of a slave around 19 to 1800 BC would have been 20 shekels. Now, here's the amazing thing. Not only has the Bible got the right denomination, it's got the right currency, but it's got the right price of a slave in the right period. That's how accurate the Bible is. We don't ask it to be that accurate. It just turns out to be accurate. Isn't it great? The Quran doesn't even get the right currency. It doesn't even get the right denomination. It assumes there's coins at that time. A shekel is not a coin. A shekel is a weighted measure. 20 shekels is about 2.2% of a kilogram of silver. That's exactly what you would expect in the 1800 BC. Why did the Quran get it so wrong? Well, I'm going to ask another question. Is a dirham the right currency maybe that was existing at the time of Muhammad? Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe Muhammad was trying to give a revelation, trying to help the people at that time to use a currency they would have understand. Basically, he was trying to contextualize the story for that age. So dirhams is what they would have used. Did they use dirham at the time of Muhammad? And the answer is no. The only coins that were used at that time were drachmas. So when were dirhams invented? They were invented in 642. Muhammad died in 632. Is there a problem with that? Unless Muhammad's prophetic, He's basically talking about a coin that was yet to be invented. What does that suggest to you? Not only is this a historical anachronism, it doesn't belong in the Quran. The fact that it's using a name of a coin that was yet to be invented seems to suggest it was written much later. Ooh, tu -tu 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 -tu. I'm going to leave it right there. We're going to have a break now, and we're going to come back with that. We're going to show you exactly how we can prove that. We're going to now start looking and asking some damaging questions after we get back from the break, because that's exactly what the new Orientalist, this new revisionist school, is asking. Could this book possibly have been written after Muhammad? Maybe this book had nothing to do with Muhammad. Now, that's a pretty heavy statement. We'll come back to you in about 10 minutes, and we'll try to answer that. We're coming into the 20th century, and now we're going to look at the more polemical approach uh, of the Quran. We're going to be looking at the historical critique and there's a group of people called revisionists. These are the new um, orientalists. They're, when we say orientalists, these are individuals who are from the West who are studying the Orient. Now, that's an old term. Uh, back in the days in the 1800s when the term was coined, the Orient meant the Middle East, and it's still stuck today. Today we mean Orient. We, probably, we also include parts of China and the Far East. But Orientalism, the word, still exists. And so when you hear someone is called an Orientalist, they are studying basically the Middle East and primarily Islam. And it's the Orientalists, the school within Orientalism, are starting to ask some damaging questions. Primarily here in London at the School of Oriental and African Studies down the road uh, in Russell Square. Also in Oxford University, Cambridge, uh, places like uh, Saarland University in Saarbrücken in w Western Germany, and then also Princeton University in the United States. These are the places where they're starting to ask some very historical questions about the Quran. The, all we have known about how the Quran was to put together is what we know as the classical model, the model that uh, the Quran was sent down to a Prophet Muhammad over a 22 to year period, 610 to 632. That's the classical model. No one has really doubted it. No one has really ever uh, tried to unpack it or tried to critique it. And so today they are starting to do that. And what they're doing is they're basically applying the same historical method that was applied to the Bible, they're now applying to the Quran. 
historical criticism, redacted criticism, source criticism, higher and lower criticism, literary criticisms. These criticisms that had been, were started in the late 1800s with Wellhausen there at this Tübingen in, in Germany have now been incorporated men, by men like Noldecke and, and uh, Goldziher and Schacht and men like Arthur Jeffries from this country. And it's these individuals who are starting to come to some conclusions and these are the conclusions that you can see here. Islam, they're saying, as we know it, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. Secondly, the Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 100 to 200 years. Now, that's an awful lot to say. How do they come to their conclusions? Why is it they're saying this? Well, some of the principal revisionists, uh, I'm going to introduce you today just so you know who they are and what they're saying. Men like John Wandsborough, who's an American, though he spent most of his time here in Britain and spent most of his time at the School of Oriental and African Studies, head of department there, who basically found that when he looked at the Quran and when he looked at many of the stories in the Quran, many of those stories that existed could not have existed in the 7th century in the central part of Arabia, Hijaz, that central area that Muhammad would have lived. They would have only been borrowed, been brought in in a much later period, probably the 8th century, in a much far, further out, possibly in places like Baghdad, Damascus, Basra, those areas, certainly not in the central part of Arabia, because these stories would have not existed that in that area, which seemed to suggest that maybe the Quran was put together at a much later date. That's all he said, with many different sectarian influences, sectarian, uh, uh, sectarian writings that influenced the Quran, and it caused an awful lot of storm back in the 1970s when he wrote that. One of his students, Dr. Michael Cook, who was also at School of Oriental African Studies, uh, took it one step further. And basically, if you look at that timeline, you'll see. The problem is this. If you look and see when Muhammad was born, the birth in 570, the, when he first received his revelation at the Hira Cave in 610, uh, when he moved with his followers in 622 called the Hijra, and when the Qibla, the direction of prayer, was then canonized in 624, and then when he died in 632, those are just a few smattering incidents in his life. There are many more than that that we could put up there. That 22-year period would, should have been written down. There should be some documents about it, right? Where do we get the stories about Muhammad, about all those events? Where do they come from? Well, they come from the traditions. Now, what are the traditions? Well, the traditions are the sayings of the prophet, the hadith. Uh, there's about 600,000 of them that were put down and incorporated into about 4,500, 4,700 by a man named Al-Bughari in 870. That's a good 230 to 250 years later. We also know that the story of the Prophet himself, the Sira, Tu Rasulullah, the Sira would be the story, the biography of the Prophet was first written down by a man named Ibn Ishaq. You can see his date is 765, Muhammad died 632. We don't have any of Ibn Ishaq's material. They've all long been lost. We're dependent on two of his disciples who gleaned what they wanted and threw away the rest. And that material was written down by Ibn Hisham and Al-Waqidi. And both of them died around 833, 835, the ninth century. So that's 200 years after the fact. Now, if you want to go and understand this book here, and as I said, 20% of it, you, even the scholars don't understand, you've got to go to the commentaries, the tafsir. The tafsir would be those commentaries first written down by Al-Tabari. He died in 923. He's the first to write down any commentary on the Quran. Others come after him, by Dawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and many others. But that was first compiled in the 10th century. The histories of all of mankind is the fourth genre, the tahriq. Those are all the history of mankind leading up until the Prophet himself, first written down by Al-Tabari and others that came after. But that was first incorporated, first written down in the 10th century. So what I'm telling you is basically everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about the Quran, everything we know about the, in the whole emergence of Islam, how it began, what happened in Medina, what happened in Mecca, how he moved from Mecca to Medina, all these stories that incorporate his life and how the Quran was then compiled and put together, all these stories only begin to appear in the 9th century and the 10th century for that which is happening in the 7th century. Is that a problem for any of you? It should be hugely problem because the same accusation has been made against the New Testament, has it not? Let's talk about the New Testament. Let's do a quick comparison. Do we not also have the Hadith of Jesus? Yes, we do. The Hadith of Jesus would be the Gospel account of Jesus, the Gospel account of his what he said, that's the lead, red letter part of your gospel account in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where it's ever is written in red, if you have that in your Bible, that's where Jesus was speaking. That's the hadith of Jesus. We also have the siddha of Jesus. His life was written in the black letter part of the gospels. That's what he did and said and what he, uh, where he went. 
So there's the Siddha of Jesus and the Hadith of Jesus and the Gospels of Jesus. We also have the Tafsir, the commentaries about the Gospel, and that's written in Paul's letters. Paul's letters to the different, different cities. And that, of course, is, uh, uh, would be the Tafsir of Jesus. But then we also have the Tahrik, the history of the early church in the book of Acts, do we not? So you have all four genres that we're talking about, all of them written in the four Gospels, the book of Acts, and the letters of Paul. All four genres, the Hadith, the Sirah, the Tafsir, and the Tahrik of Jesus Christ. When were they written? Two to three hundred years after the fact? Liberal scholars like us to believe that. But we know that three of the Gospels, we know that the book of Acts, let's start with the most historical book, the book of Acts was written between 52 AD and 62 AD. That's within 30 years of Christ's death. We know that the person who wrote the book of Acts, Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke along with Matthew around, and Mark would have been written before that. So three of the Gospels would have been written within 20 years of Christ's death. We know that all of Paul's letters, the, which would be the tafsir, would all have been written within 15 to 20 years of Christ's death. So you've got three of the Gospels, the, the tahrik of Jesus, also all the tafsir of Jesus, all of them written within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death. Is that important? Absolutely. Because who were they written for? They were written for the disciples, for the early church, the disciples who had been with Jesus. They were still with Jesus in Jerusalem up until 70 AD. So all of them were written while the disciples were still living in Jerusalem. They were the eyewitnesses. Even Luke, who was not an eyewitness, said that at the very beginning of Luke. Oh, Theophilus, I have taken upon myself. And basically he's saying, I have taken it to write that which you have told me. Correct me if I'm right. Correct me, I'm sorry, if I'm wrong. <laughs> Don't correct me if I'm right. You got it already. There I'm wrong. Can you see what we're saying here? When you look at the tafsir and the tahrik, the hadith and the siddha of Jesus, it's within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death, while the disciples were still there to corroborate it or dispute it. When you look at the tafsir, tahrith, siddha, and the tahrik of Muhammad and the Quran, it's two to 300 years, written hundreds of miles away, hundreds of years distant, nobody was there to corroborate it or dispute it. Can you see the problem? And that's why we're now looking back and saying, can we trust any of this genre of material? since it's written hundreds of years later, written by people who never knew the prophet, never were there when the Quran was being compiled, were not even living in Arabia. Look at the names, Buhari from Buharistan, Tabari from Tabaristan. These are in Iran and Iraq today. They are in the wrong area. They are in the wrong place hundreds of years after the fact. That's why the Orientalists are now starting to ask some damaging questions. They're going back to the seventh century and they're saying, what actually happened? That's a historical question. That's a legitimate question. That's exactly what we're going to do to Jesus Christ in a few weeks when we ask for the historical Jesus versus the Issa of the, Isla of the Quran. So let's go back and see what they're finding. And this is where it gets a little damaging and gets a little angry. Now, what uh, they're saying is this. If the knowledge of the life of Muhammad was transmitted orally for a century before it was reduced to writing, then the chances are that the material, which we have, the material will have undergone considerable alteration in the process. Is that so? There was a book written in the 1970s which has been hotly disputed, written by a, two people, Dr. Patricia Corona and Dr. Michael Cook. Both of them had studied under Wandsburg here at uh, SOAS. Dr. Patricia Corona became head of department at Oxford University. Uh, she was my supervisor when I began my doctorate, uh, so I know her personally. And she wrote a book called Hagerism in the 1970s with Michael Cook, which basically asked this question. What do we know about how Islam began? Now, she has gone back on much what she has written back in the 1970s because new data is coming to the fore. But some things we, they have found since then have been proved to be damaging. Let's start with the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction of prayer. Every Muslim, when you see them praying, they're praying towards Mecca. That's the Qibla. If you go into a mosque, you'll see a mihrab, which is a little niche that's put in the wall, and that's the direction where Mecca is, wherever it is in the world. And it's, in this case, it'll be southeast. Now, the Qibla should, was canonized according to the Quran in Surah 2, Ayah 145. That Qibla was canonized in 624. After Muhammad came down from this night of power, he then gets this revelation in Surah 145 that stipulates that the Qibla, which had been towards Jerusalem for the first two years in 622 to 624, then was redirected back to Mecca in 624, right? Which means any mosque that was built after 624 should be facing Mecca, correct? which means every mosque, because there were no mosques before 624. They hadn't yet moved out of Medina. There is no mosque that we can get our hands on, except for some mosques that have been found in places like the Wasit Mosque and the Kufa Mosque. These are two mosques that are found just south of what is today Baghdad, in the city of Kufa and Wasit. Men like uh, uh, 
Creswell and also Fahravardi have studied these mosques in 1905, about over 100 years ago. They were the first ones to go and uncover these mosques and dig down to the original floor plans. And when they got to the original floor plans, which are floor plans from the mid 7th century to the late 7th century, so they're much later than 624, when they got to the original floor plans, they found that the Qiblas were facing west. They should have been facing south towards Mecca. And they scratched their head and said, this is curious. That's all they said. And I'm raising my hand and says, yeah, it's curious. Give us some conclusion. They didn't want to come to any conclusion. We have got to come to some conclusion. When they went to Egypt, they went to outside of Cairo to Fustat, which is the garrison town outside of Cairo, and they found a mosque there, which was one of the earliest mosques, the earliest mosque to be built there. They dug down to its floor plan, and they found that its Qibla was facing east. It should have been facing south. Take a look at the map, and you'll see why this is a problem. Can you see where Kufa is? If Mecca is straight below it, the mosque Qibla should be facing towards the south. They're facing west. Over in Cairo, just outside Cairo, the Fustat Mosque is facing east. It should also be facing southeast. What are they facing? You're getting the idea. Something's gone wrong. At least for the 7th century, no mosques were facing Mecca, according to the archaeological evidence. Now, a writer in 705 named Jacob of Edessa mentions and refers to the fact that the Maghrai, which is another name for the Arabs at that time, so from all this it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews in the Maghrai, these Arabs here in the regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem of the, or the Kaaba. He calls Jerusalem the Kaaba. The patriarchal places of their races. Now that's curious. What do we have in Jerusalem? We have the Dome of the Rock, built by Abdul al-Malik in 691. Abdul al-Malik, the great reformer, the Arab reformer, we know him as the great Arab reformer because he's the one that made Arabic the, the international language of the day. He's the one that took off all the images and replaced it with Arabic script and he built this great building in 691, the third holiest shrine in Islam called the Dome of the Rock. But when you look at the Dome of the Rock, you will notice it's, based in an octo it's built on an octagonal shape, an eight-sided shape. Why would you build a building in an eight-sided shape unless you're doing circumambulation? You're going around it. What's more, it has no Qibla. I did a debate in 1998, and I made this fact, and they laughed me out of the room when they said, Mr. Smith, you haven't done your homework. If you look on the dome, you will look up on the drum. It has Surah 17, Ayah 1 written on the drum, and an inscription there. And on the southern portico, above the southern door, you will see Surah, 4, Surah 2, Ayah 145, which talks about the Qibla. That's the Qibla. The drum talks about that, uh, that, the, 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 uh, that uh, Muhammad went from the great mosque to the farthest mosque, proving that this was a mosque at that time when Muhammad went there in 624. I say that may be so. It may be there today, but you haven't done your homework either. When do you think those inscriptions were put there? They were put there in 1876, a little over 100 years ago. They were put there for that very reason, because there is no Qibla on the Dome of the Rock. It's been rebuilt 11 times. And every time they rebuilt it, they keep on adding to it when they realize, theologically speaking, and historically speaking, you cannot have such a large object in the middle of Jerusalem with no Qibla unless it was the Qibla. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. When it was first built. Now, we're not saying that. Don't quote me on that. We need to do an awful lot more research. But can you see the problem? When you go to the Dome of the Rock, if you go into the Dome of the Rock, you will see the only original part of the Dome of the Rock are the inner ambulatories that you see there on the screen. Those inner ambulatories have Quranic verses. They do have Quranic verses, but they're not the same Quranic verses we have in the Quran here. And almost all of them do not talk about why the building was built. Now, Muslims say the reason the building was built is because this is where Muhammad went in the night of power when he went in on the back of the burak, the winged horse, from Mecca to Medina, I'm sorry, from Mecca to Jerusalem. That's why Surah 17, Ayah 1 is important, that it's up on the drunk, because that it mentions that Muhammad went from Mecca to Jerusalem, the farthest mosque. You have to scratch your head. What mosque was there in Jerusalem in 624? Remember, there were no mosques at all, anywhere, uh, until after 624. In fact, Jerusalem was not even conquered by the Muslims until 641. So there could not have been a mosque there prior to 641. So what mosque did Muhammad go to in 624? Ask that to your Muslim friends. And what are they going to do with Surah 17, Ayah 1? Ooh, two, two, two. Let's come on back. When you look at those inner ambulatories, it's got Quranic verses, but they're not the same verses. In fact, they say nothing about this great event of him moving on the back of the winged horse to that rock and then going up to the seven heavens, meeting Allah in the seventh heaven, telling, finding from Allah that he's supposed to pray 50 times a day, comes down to heavens and meets Moses, says, ah, that's too many. Come on, see, get it down. So he goes back up to Allah and gets it down to 45. And he goes back and forth between Moses and Allah, bringing it from 50 to 45 to 30, down to 20, down to five. Finally, when he gets it to five prayers, Moses says, that's 
enough. Now, isn't it interesting? So it's Moses that tells us that's enough, and he comes on back down to Jerusalem, to this place, and then flies on back down to Mecca on the back of the winged horse. Great story. <laughs> Difficult, however, because if that is the reason why this building was built, there should be something written about it. You look at every one of those inscriptions on the inner ambulatories, and it says nothing about that event. All it talks about is God can only be one, and he has no partners. Now, who's that against? Surah 3, Ayah 76. Have you not heard that in the last week? Isn't this what the, the letter that the Arab scholars, the Muslim scholars are saying in Jordan that basically defines who God is? He is one and he has no partners, but you will not find he has no partners in Surah 3, or in Surah in the Shahada because it did not exist at that time. The Shahada had no idea if he has no partners. It talks about the fact that God could not be one of three. In fact, almost every one of the inscriptions up there are anti-Christian polemics. They're against us. This building had nothing to do with that night of power, had nothing to do with Muhammad flying on a wing horse, had everything to do as a one-upmanship to basically snub their nose at Christians. Because look at the architecture. It was built basically in the same design as that which we find in the great, the great cathedral in Damascus, but a bigger one. It's a one-upmanship, thumbing their nose at the Christians, the Byzantines, from which the, the Arabs had taken Jerusalem. Fascinating, isn't it? The rocks are telling us the story. The bigger question is this. I'm going to pass this one up because the Jews is not that important. Let's go to the next one for lack of time. Go to Patricia Corona. She's the one that's really been helping us out. Patricia Corona out of Denmark is a woman that is tenacious. And she's greater and certainly has a lot more tenacious than many men I know. And she's one of the few women I know that really wants to take Islam head on, historically. Uh, she speaks 15 languages, all of them archaic. How many of you can speak 15 archaic languages? This woman is a linguist and I'm glad she's on our side. She's not a Christian, by, by the way, but she is a, a, one of the top Orientalists in the world today. Uh, she was studied at SOAS, was head of department at Oxford University when I got to know her, and then was headhunted by Cambridge University, was head of department there, now has been headhunted by Princeton University, and she's head of department there. And everything she does comes out with a huge amount of controversy, because basically what she is doing is what every historian should do, and that is she's going back to the original sources reading them in their original languages, the inscriptions that are there, the manuscripts that exist, what little ones they do. And it's these inscriptions that she's reading that is starting to prove very damaging to early Islam. She wanted to find out about this hijrah, the movement from Mecca to Medina, according to Muslims that happened in 622. She's found 56 references to this hijrah, all of which do not occur in 622. In fact, they occurred right through the seventh century. But what is interesting, none of them mention any reference to a place called Mecca. There's no reference to any city in Mecca in any of them. They talk sometimes about the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia, going to the north. And she said, well, this is interesting. Why is it none of them talk about Mecca? What do we know about Mecca? Well, we know it's a center of Islam. It's a center of history. Remember what I said a few weeks ago, that when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, they were thrown down to Mecca, according to the traditions. So it's possibly the oldest city in the world. We also know it's the first sanctuary appointed to mankind that we see in Surah 3, Ayah 96. And also, it's the mother of all settlements, according to Surah 692 and Surah 42, Ayah 5. So it's a pretty substantial city. What's more than that, it's where the sanctuary is, but it's also was the center of trade, north, south, east, and west. So Dr. Patricia Kron looked at this map. This is a map of what Arabia would have looked like in the 7th century. And you can see it uses names that probably you're no, you don't recognize. You probably can't even read it. They're too small. But what it does say... And what it does show is something very curious. I don't know if you can find it. If you look on the left side of the Arabian Peninsula, can you see a green line going up the left side of the Arabian Peninsula? Probably not. We need to give you a bigger map. Let me just, and trust me that I'm right. If you start at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula with Gaza, I'm sorry, um, with Aden at the south, you can follow that line going up through Najran to Sana, I'm coming up to Taif. From Taif, it suddenly makes a detour down to Mecca or in your case, down this side to Mecca. I don't know if you can see that. So it goes up from Aden in the south, comes up, Nazaran, comes up to Taif, and it goes down to Mecca, about 1,000 feet. Then it comes back up again and goes up to Yathrib, which is now called Medina. Then goes up to Tabuk, Haibar, and up to Gaza in the north. Why is that significant? Patricia Corona looked at that and says, why had no one noticed this before? That is the trade route, that green line. Those are the trade oases along the trade route that all the traders had to use. It's according to Islam, Mecca was a center of trade, north, south, east, and west. There's a problem. Mecca's not on the trade route. It's down off the trade route. All of these trading oases are on a plateau. 
Mecca is a good thousand feet off this plateau. Why hadn't anybody noticed that before? So she wrote a book in 1987 called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam, looking and asking what the questions or the challenges that Muslims gave concerning Mecca. And of course, they said that the Mecca was basically the, the greatest trading city of its time, north, south, east, and west. It controlled the trade, and it basically it traded 15 different spices. So she took a chapter per spice, and she found out that none of the spices came from Mecca at all. There is no reference at all to any place called Mecca. What's more, she said people hadn't looked at the trade route. They hadn't looked at their own history. Now, she read all the languages that were needed, so she went back to the second century, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh century, all the way up until the time of Islam, read all the trading documents that she could get her hands on, read the historians like Cosmos, Procopius, Theodoretus. These are the, the historians that were writing at that time in the fourth and fifth century. They were writing about those area, that part of the world. She read everything she could find to see if there's any reference to a city called Mecca or there's any reference to a trade through Mecca. And what she found was very interesting. She found that there was no trade whatsoever through the Hejaz or that part of Arabia because the Arabs were not in charge of the universal trade, all of which would have come from, in your case, looking over here, from India and China in the, in the east, coming across over to the Mediterranean world, it would have had to come across the Arabian Sea. If you look on the map, you'll see it. They would have gone across the Arabian Sea, but they normally, the trade went up through the Persian Gulf. But then you had the great wars between the Sassanids, the Sassanids, the Iranians today, the Persians then, and the Byzantines, who were the Christians. They were warring for 200 years in the 5th and 6th century. So that stopped the trade going to the Persian Gulf. Had to redirect it down around to the Aden in the south. And then according to Islamic tradition, that trade then was taken off the ship there in Aden, and they went 1,250 miles up to Gaza in the north. Are you following me? Up across the deserts. She said no one had looked at their historical record. Why would you take trade off the ship in Aden to go 1,250 miles on Camelback when you have a waterway that goes up the west coast. Take a look at it, the Red Sea. The Red Sea goes 1,250 miles. You're already on ship. She found that if you take a ton of goods and you just go 50 miles by land, you'd take the same amount of price as going 1,250 miles by sea. It would have been much more expensive to go by land, prohibitively expensive to go by land. Why had no one noticed this? And that's why she went through these trading documents. She went through all the trading documents to see if anybody knew about a place called Mecca. And then she found another interesting thing. All the maritime trade which existed there, which was, a, which was the trade between the Mediterranean world and uh, India and China, had nothing to do with Arabs, had everything to do with Africans. It was the Ethiopians that controlled the trade. It was Agilis, the city of Agilis, which is today in Eritrea the capital of Richard, the Agilis that controlled all the trade, they were the maritime people, their names were on all the documents, they were ones who had names all the way in India. There was no Arab names at all because the Arabs hated water. They liked the sands. They were nothing more than horse traders and camel herders. What she also found is the only trade that went through Mecca or any of that part of the world was nothing more than leather and milk. Not much to be, build a big empire on. Can you see what she's done? Can you see why the Muslims are angry with her? What she's done in one fell swoop is to prove that most everything we know about Mecca, about the sanctuary, about where Adam and Eve went, or about where Abra uh, Abraham supposedly went with Ishmael to build the Kaaba in 1900 BC, about everything we know about Muhammad, where he went to live there and actually came in, went circumambulated, all these stories are proving to be fraudulent. Why? Because the earliest reference we have to any city called Mecca is not till 724. Muhammad died in 632. Does that not bother any of you? It better bother all of you. Thank God we don't have this kind of problem for our Bible. Thank God when we make a date, we put a date, it's supported not by our own dating, it's supported by extra biblical evidence. And that's why we have the British Museum Tour, just to show you how much you have right even here in your museum that helps you out with dating our Bible. You cannot do this with a Quran. And that's why something as simple as asking one question about the city, the greatest city of all mankind, according to Islam, cannot be supported by the historical facts. Interesting, isn't it? To date, Muslims have not been able to answer that question. And that was written in 1987. The words Muslim and Islam, supposedly all Muslims were called this. When they went back and when she looked back at all the earliest documents, she found that the names that they called themselves were Magratai or Magrai, which talks about the area of the air world they are, the Hagarines or the Ishmaelites, which talked about the tradition that they came in, the Ishmaelite Hagarine tradition. They called themselves the Mahajurun, which means the people of the Hijr. Hijr means of the Exodus people of the Exodus. There's no reference to any people called Muslim or a religion called Islam at all in the seventh century. Islam and the word Muslim don't appear until the late seventh century, excuse me, in the sense of submission to God, 
Now, of course, they like to say it has to do with peace. There was a man named Yehuda Neville out of the University of Jerusalem that did one step, one step further. He wanted to look at the, the references to Muhammad himself. And he wanted to look at the reference to the, what we call the Muhammadan formula. There is only one God, but God and Muhammad is his prophet, which is the second part of that shahada. And so he looked and asked, what did people know about Muhammad at that time? So he went into the inscriptions, as many inscriptions as he could find, many times on pieces of stone and clay tablets. He found hundreds of them, translated them. And what he found was interesting. He noticed that even when he looked at these inscriptions, there was no reference to a person named Muhammad who was a prophet and leader of men, though there are two references to Muhammad on other references. So, for instance, the, um, the uh, I'm trying to think of the name. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, It'll come to me, it'll come to me. In, in 643, there's a reference, it's a tract written by Christians to beware of Muhammad. So we know that he is historical, that's not in doubt. What is interesting is when he looked at the caliphal protocols, these are the official documents written by the caliphs, there in the caliphal courts of the Mu'awiyahs and the Mu'awiyah right up until the time of Abdul al-Malik. So that's during the Mu'awiyah period and the Sufyani period of the Umayyad Caliphate. These are a lot of names. They'll go in this way, or ear out this year. I have, feel sorry for this poor fellow who has to translate all these into hand sign language. <laughs> but these are Arabic names of, of, of caliphs, of kings, from 661 up until 685, up until 680, 690. And it's these kind of protocols that Patricia Crone was looking at. And what she was found, uh, found was very interesting. I'm sorry, Yehuda Neva was looking at. And what he found was very interesting. There is no reference in any of these caliphal protocols to the Mohammedan formula. The first reference he could find to the Mohammedan formula is on the Dome of the Rock, built in 691. And also on some coins coined in 692 in what is present day Iraq. Now stop and ask yourself, is that not a problem as well? And what was more interesting is that up until 691 or 692, when these caliphal protocols never mentioned him, it almost was incorporated overnight. And almost overnight, suddenly, every caliphal protocol from that time on, from 691 on, included Muhammad as a pre-universal prophet. So it was imposed by the caliph himself in 691. Muhammad died in 632. It took them 60 years to finally realize that Muhammad was a universal prophet. Ooh, two, 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 two. What this is showing us looks like that Islam evolved along its way. That the Prophet Muhammad and his, his basically his importance evolved as well. And much of his usage of him as a person, he, we know he's historical, that's not in doubt. But the fact that he was a universal prophet was probably introduced during the time of Abdul al-Malik in the late 7th century. If you have a man who becomes a prophet in the line of the prophets, you then have to have a book, do you not? You need to then have a revelation. And it's people like G.R. Hotting and Andrew Rippon who are now coming up and they're looking at what we now know as the Quranic manuscripts. And now we're gonna move into the Quran itself and now it gets pretty interesting. Because now we're dealing with this book. We're coming back to this book, which we need to talk about today anyways. What are we gonna do with this book and what are we gonna do with the fact that the questions that have been put to the Bible need to be asked about this book? Because this book is the foundation of Islam. It is this book that every book Muslim must know. The one they memorized, the one they believed was revealed to the prophet from 610 to 622. The claim they make is that it was collated perfectly. Arthur Jeffries, who in the um, 1930s did his whole work looking at the earliest manuscripts, looking at all, everything that the, that the tradition said about those earliest manuscripts and found out that they referred to not just one Quran, there were about 16 Qurans that he came across from their own uh, compilations. And what we know is the four metropolitan Qurans. These are the four most famous Qurans that existed immediately after the time of Muhammad and around the time of Uthman, around 650. You have the, the Quran that became very popular in Medina. That was one written by Zaid ibn Thabit. You have the Quran that became very popular in Kufa. The Quran written by Ubala, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud. The Quran that became very popular in Basra. The, the Quran of Ibn Musa. And the one that became very popular in Baghdad. That of Ubay ibn Kaab. I'm sorry. Uh, in, in, um, I got it wrong here. Let's make sure I get this right. Ibn Masud became very popular in Kufa and in Baghdad. Ibn Musa. Ubn Musa became very popular in Basra, and Ubay ibn Qabs became very popular in Damascus. But take a look at each one of those four Qurans, and you will find that they disagree almost 15,000 differences between them. How many Muslims have told you this? What is it that Muslims claim about the Quran? It's perfect. Do they not say that? It has never been changed. What are they going to do with these four metropolitan codices? The fact that they all disagree. Two of these codices have two extra surahs even. 
616 surahs rather, rather, rather than 114 surahs. Probably the best way to answer that is to go back to al-Buhari himself because he's the one where we get most of this material from. In uh, volume six, hadith number 509 and 510, you have reference to the fact that in 650, Uthman, the third caliph, realized that there were many different Qurans, and so he had the original Quran that was first compiled by Zaidi bin Thabit uh, in the time of 632 after Muhammad died, given to the, one of the wives of Muhammad named Hafsa, put under her bed for safekeeping, had him go and take that original codex, codex book, and he, along with three others, Zubair, Alas, and Hari, the four of them were to rewrite that book. That's what it says there in Al-Buhari. They were to rewrite it. Now, why would you rewrite something that was perfect? You see, there's a problem there. And then it says, if they disagreed, how can you disagree on something that's perfect? If they disagreed, they were to write it in the Qureshi dialect. Now, immediately, your bells should be ringing. You all know Arabic really well. You know that if they're, in order to understand dialect Arabic, you have to have vowelization, because Arabic is a consonantal text, like Hebrew. Consonants do not change. Vowels do. In fact, vowels didn't even exist in the 7th century. They were not invented until the 8th century. The Dhamma, the Kasra, and the Vata were only incorporated into the Quran for that very reason, because dialects started to form. And in order to understand dialectic difference in a written text, you need to have vowelization. Are you following me? None of you are following me. Don't worry, it's not important. Let those people who are dealing with us, let us who have to argue it in court, let us worry about it. But can you see what's going on here? This is another error built into the text, proving that, there was th that what Buhari was saying in the 9th century did not exist at all in the 7th century. He was basically telling us what was wrong in the 9th century and redacting it back to the 7th century. But then he did a most curious thing. He ordered, this is Uthman now, ordered that all the other Quranic materials, Uthman, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Why do you burn manuscripts? Unless they don't agree. Now, it's not me saying it. This is their own material. Al-Buhari is the most authoritative source, second only to the Quran. It is sahih, means it is perfect. You cannot doubt, you dare not dispute Al-Buhari, and yet even Al-Buhari admits that all the earliest manuscripts were burnt, were destroyed, 20 years after Muhammad's death. Is that not a problem for any of you? When Muslims say it has never been changed, what are they going to do with the fact that, according to Ibn Dawud, some of the Quranic verses were lost? What are they going to do with when as Suyuti says that much of the Quran has disappeared? Or what are they going to do when Sahih Muslim in the Hadith says that parts of the Quran have been forgotten? Or that parts have been canceled according to Sahih Buhari? What are they going to do with the fact that according to Sahih Buhari, others, parts of the many, much of the Quran is now missing? Or parts of it have been overlooked according to Ibn Dawud. Now all of these, Ibn Dawud, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Buhari, these are the earliest compilers of the traditions. What we know is the Hadith. No one disputes any of these first six compilers, especially not Buhari. Yet look what they're telling us. Mu'atta ibn Malik says that some verses have been changed. Ibn Abi Dawud mentions that others have been modified. Lost, disappeared, forgotten, canceled, missing, overlooked, changed, modified. Does this sound like a book which was collated perfectly and completely? Now, everything I have told you in the last five minutes does not come from me. Everything I've mentioned up here, all of this comes from their sources. Muslims have not read their sources. They have no idea of what I've just told you. Muslims need to hear this. They need to read this because this is damaging to the Quran. Because this proves to me that the Quran we have in our hand today was not compiled by one man, was not even in existence during his lifetime was not even probably in existence 20 years after his lifetime. And even after this, where are those Qurans? Now, let's move on. Let's look at the manuscript evidence itself. There are about different types of script that you use in, in Arabic. You have the Ma'il script, you have what we call the Mas script, the Kufic script, the, the Nas script, the Hijazi script. These scripts need to be looked at, and what we're asking Muslims is to show us the earliest manuscript. Muslims say the Quran is complete, and it's always been complete from the time of Uthman. And they say this book that we have in our hand today was, is the Uthmanic recension, canonized by Uthman in 650, basically 18 to 20 years after Muhammad's death. That's what they tell us, right? My question to them, and you need to ask your Muslim friends the same question, where are those manuscripts? Where are the four, four earliest manuscripts that were compiled by Zaidi bin Thabit? One was left in Medina, one was left in Basra, one was left in Baghdad, one was left in Damascus. Where are they? Show us them. And they'll probably show you this one right here. 
This is the top copy manuscript. The top copy manuscript, as you can see, uh, there in the top copy museum in the top copy palace there in Istanbul in Turkey. You can go and it's open to the public. This is taken by, by a picture by a friend of mine. When you look at it, you'll, it looks like an archaic text because it has no vowelization and has no diacritical marks, the dots that are above and below the line. The dots that are, if you have a letter, it just looks like a bowl shape. If you put one dot above it, it makes it a nun, a na. If you put two dots above it, it makes it a ta. If you make two, three dots above it, it makes it a tha. Put a dot below it, it makes it a ba. Put two dots below it, it makes it a ya. Na, ta, tha, ba, ya. Which one is it? That's five different possibilities just for one little letter. That's why diacritical marks needed to be added. And diacritical marks were only added in the 8th century. So all the earliest Qurans had no diacritical marks. Ha! Huh. If you go down to the Kufic Quran right here in the British Library, it doesn't have diacritical marks as well. And it's a 9th century Quran. So you'll find even Qurans in the 9th and 10th century don't have diacritical marks. Now, they say this is a hijaz, this is, I'm sorry, a 7th century Quran. But they won't let us touch it. We can't go and do any forensic evidence. We would love to be able to look into it. We would be able to love to do some accelerated mass spectrography on it to be able to date it. They won't let us touch it. So the only thing we can do is look at its script. What we do know is that this Quran here only goes up to around Surah 40 to, 40, Surah 40 to 45. It is not complete. There should be 114 Surahs in it. But what's most damaging is the script that it used. Take a look at that script. Can you see it's, got, it's elongated? Can you see the elongation between the majuscules? There are parts that are long, that's the elongation. That is a unique script. We call that the Kufic script or the Abbasid script because it was introduced during the Abbasid period. The Abbasids came to power in 749, Muhammad died in 632. See the dates? Now, if there had been a Quran written at the time of Muhammad or Uthman, it would have been using this script. This is called the Ma'il or Hijazi script. The Ma'il script is a subgroup of the Hijazi script and this is the Quran that you'll find in the British Library. Considered to be by some to be the second oldest Quran in the world. It only goes up to Surah 41. It is not complete. It's called a 2165 manuscript. There's a problem. If this was one of those original Uthmanic texts, then we could believe that the Quran existed at that time. But this is dated to around 790, late 8th century. So it's a very late, well, it's still early, but it's later than Uthman. The other text that people look at is, um, before I do that, let me just show you why we are now dating the script. When you look at the script, you need to ask what the script looked like. And we know that by looking at the coins. If you go to the British Museum, you will see in the, uh, in the, uh, the coin section there, uh, Dr. Venetia Porter has done a great job of putting the coins in the order of their uh, orthography. And you'll see that the kind of script that was on the coins in the 7th century was this script. That's the script you find in the Ma'il Quran, is it not? Strong majuscules up and down, slightly slanted by the Ma'il version of it, but not the elongation that we're looking for. It's not until you get to this manuscript and these, oh, here's one more manuscript. This is the Samarkand manuscript that you find that elongation. And that elongation on the Samarkand manuscript in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan, is also considered to be one of the original manuscripts. The difficulty is, with that elongation, you need to date it. This particular manuscript here only goes up to Surah 41. It is not complete as well. It's when you look at the coins that you see when that elongation was incorporated. Those coins are Abbasid coins, incorporated in 749. And it's with those incorporation of those coins that that script was introduced. And that's the script that we find in the Samarkand in the top copy. So when Muslims say that these are 7th century manuscripts, they haven't looked at the coins. They're not 7th century manuscripts at all. At the earliest, they could only be mid 8th century manuscripts. What we're now finding out is they are 9th century manuscripts. These are 200 years after the fact, which means they've got to find a manuscript that is found within that 200 year period, right? In order to convince us, to convince you, especially me. Well, a manuscript has been found in 1975. As they were 75, they're in Sana, in Yemen. As they were cleaning out the Sana mosque, they were cleaning out the dome, they came across a trap door, they opened the trap door, thousands of manuscripts fell to the floor. Now that's not surprising. When a Quran gets old, rather than burning it, like they don't do, they, they did in the beginning, but they don't do any longer, they'll take that manuscript and they'll put it up and hide it up in the, the dome of a mosque. And so that's why many mosques have manuscripts in them. They had just forgotten about this particular trap door and about those manuscripts. So when they fell to the ground, it surprised them. Pri primary because there was one manuscript amongst them, there are thousands that are there, but there was one amongst them that they could not read. So they flew down some German scholars, Dr. Gerd Prynne, Dr. von Bothmer, Dr. Karl-Heinz Oleg, 
They flew them down from Saarbrücken University in Saarland, Saarland University in Saarbrücken. They flew them down because these are considered to be the world's uh, authority on early Arabic script. In 1981, they had a look at these manuscripts and they took pictures of them very quickly and they put them into microfilm. The Yemeni government then confiscated their microfilm and wouldn't let them look at them, so they had to go home empty-handed. It wasn't until 1997 that they finally gave them access to their own microfilms. And when they looked at those microfilms, this is what they found, and this is what they looked at. Now, I went to see Dr. Garrett Prater, and he showed me, and I have to be careful what I say from here on out, because he has not published what he's shown me, so I'm not going to tell you what, he, what we know. What we do know, and I can say this much, is that this manuscript is not the same that we have in this Quran here. It jumps all over the place. It goes from surah to surah, jumps from here down to here. But I want you to take a look at that picture that you see up on the screen. You will see there are two different types of script. On the right-hand side, you will see a Hijazi script. That's the earlier script. There's the up and down perpendicular. You'll see surah 19 come down to that yellow mark. And then it jumps to surah 22, right there at that yellow mark. Where is surah 20 and 21? Should be there, shouldn't it? Now, if it had been at the bottom of the page and this jump had happened, you could say maybe a goat ate it or it got lost along the way. The fact that it's halfway down the page proves that it should have been there in the very beginning. On the left-hand side, suddenly Surah 20 begins. There it is at the top of the page. It's in the wrong place, but it's right next to it. But look at the script. It's a totally different script, isn't it? It's a much later script. This is what we call a family of the Abbasid script. It's about 60 to 70 years later. So what are we seeing here? Here's an evidence of a, a Quran that evolved from 705 on the right to around the late 8th century on the left. Can you see what we're show this is showing us? This is the first example we have proving that the Quran was not even canonized, had not yet been finished in, as late as 705. Muhammad died in 632. This book, according to the Muslims, was canonized in 650. Yet this proves that even as late as 705, it still hadn't been complete. That's what needs to get out in the open. I can't tell you what he's saying here. I need to move on because he has yet to publish it. Take a look at these pictures. Can you see a script with a script underneath it? This is what we call a palimpsest, and what they have done is they put it under ultraviolet light. And when they looked at it under ultraviolet light, they noticed that the Quran on the top had been written earlier, below had been washed off and written over top. And what was below is not the same as what's on top. Both are Quranic, but they're both different. Proving that the Quran was even being changed as the script was being made. Ooh, two, 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 two. A perfect Quran, never been changed. The evidence seems to be going against them. And it's this material that's showing us, even as late as 705, that the Quran still had not been completed. Now, what about variants? And here I'm going to introduce a man named Keith Small, who probably will come and speak to you next week. Keith Small is quickly becoming one of the world authority on early Islamic manuscripts. He's studying it for his doctorate, looking at Surah 14, I 35 to 41, and comparing it with Acts 7, verse 1 to 8. And uh, he was just on the phone with me today, and we were looking at some of the things that he has found. What he has noticed, and what has been interesting, is that he has no they have found in Europe and all the manuscripts they've been able to get their hands on, all the manuscripts that Muslims will let us touch, there are hundreds of them, they have not found any complete Quran for the first 300 years. It doesn't exist. You will not find any Quran for the first three centuries that includes Surahs 82 to 114. And there is none that exists at all for the first 300 years that includes Surah 108 to 114. Conclusion, he, said, he would say that possibly the standardization of the verses were probably by late 7th century, but there is no extant manuscript to support it. This is only a guess. We cannot support what the Muslims are saying. The Hijazi scripted Qurans, now this is important, the earliest Qurans that we can come across, these would be the ones that should have been around, they should have, this would be the script that should have been used if a Quran would have been written in the 7th century. The Hijazi scripted Qurans only go up to Surah 76. There is not one Hijazi manuscript that goes beyond Surah 76, yet there's 114 surahs in the Quran. And that the canonized text is only found during the Abbasid period, post 749. That's over 100 years after Muhammad. Now, this is proving to be very damaging because we can come up with an entire New Testament by the 4th century. It's right here in the British Library. An entire Bible by the 5th century. It's right here in the British Library. That's three to two to three hundred years before the Quran was supposedly even written. Why can't they come up with one Quran, one complete Quran in the 7th century? In fact, just two days ago, the first complete Quran was finally sold here in Christie's. Did you hear about it? Dated 1203 A.D., 13th century, is the earliest Quran they can complete, a complete Quran they can find. Muhammad died in the 7th century. 
So from the 7th century to the 13th century, they cannot come up with one complete Quran. And the, finally, the earliest Quran that was complete was sold here for over 2 million pounds just two days ago. This is the problem with the Quran. How can Muslims say that this was complete and perfect? When the historical evidence, the scientific evidence, all the manuscript evidence that we're looking at proves them wrong. We've got to get out in public and start saying this. But who's going to say it? Let's come to some conclusions. The Hijrah, according to the historical evidence, was more than likely not towards Medina, but towards Palestine, or places north ongoing to 800. We also know that the Qibla was not fixed towards Mecca until the 8th century, but to an area much further north, possibly Jerusalem, as we saw with the Dome of the Rock. The Jews still retained a relationship with the Arabs until at least 640 AD. We didn't go on that tonight because it's not that important. And then what we do also know is that Mecca was not only unknown as a viable city until the end of the 7th century, but it was not even on the international trade route. Fifthly, the Dome of the Rock was likely used as a sanctuary, not the sanctuary, but possibly one of many sanctuaries from what we're finding out, and they were at least the earliest ones. Muhammad was not known as God's universal prophet until the late 7th century, according to the historical evidence, and that the terms Muslim in Islam were not used until the end of the 7th century. Terms used instead were Salasan, Magre, Muhajirun, Hagarin, Ishmaelite, those kind of terms. The five daily prayers that we talked about last week, as well as the Hajj, were not standardized until at, after the 8th century and not named until the 9th century. And then ninthly, that the earliest we even hear of the Quran is not until the late 7th century, though fragments exist in the late 7th century. And lastly, the earliest Quranic writings do not coincide exactly with the current Quranic text. That we see on the Dome of the Rock, in the inner ambulatories, we see it on the coins that came out of Kufa. Those Quranic references do not coincide with the Quran we have today. So even the earliest inscriptions do not exist from what we can prove today. Now, what are we going to say? From what we have seen here, what conclusions can we use in our polemics today? The many claims Muslims make for the inimitability of the Quran just do not stand up under critical scrutiny. It is not inimitable. Why? It is inferior to most other revelations. It is stylistically imperfect. It is grammatically impure. It is linguistically defective. It is universally inadequate. It is compiled piecemeal. It is full of contradictions. It is replete with errors. It has a history evolving not over 20 years to 22 years, but over 100 to 200 years. Thus, it is nothing more than a human document borrowed from numerous traditions made not by God, but by man.